Uh, good morning to all. Uh, uh, welcome to IEEE's webinar on impact of COVID-19 on FDA regime and Japanese investment in India. Uh, IEEE has been conducting series of webinar on the current issues. Uh, today's seminar will focus on uh, Japanese investment in India. Uh, I just want to give a little background on the Japanese investment uh, scene in India. Uh, according to like uh, government sources, trade and investment are the two uh, major pillar of India-Japan relation. Uh, India has been ranked as one of the most attractive investment destination in recent years. Uh, since 2000, uh, since 2000 till June 2019, and the investment to India have been around like US dollar 30.76 billion. And Japanese FDI into India has mainly been in automobile, automobile, uh, electric equipments, telecommunications, and in chemical sex, uh, sectors. Uh, during this period, number of Japanese companies in India has also increased. As of 2018, uh, thousand. 441 Japanese companies uh, registered in India and uh, many of the Japanese companies are uh, present in Bangalore and Chennai and this year onward Japan Airlines planning to operate daily direct flight uh, between Bangalore and Arita Airport uh, which actually signifies the growing bilateral relation between the two countries. Uh, so uh, we have an excellent panel here. Uh, so uh, uh, they'll be discussing about more on Japanese investment uh, at the same time the present level of investment opportunity in this country. So with this, I'd like to welcome the chair and all the speakers for the webinar. Uh, before I'm handing over the uh, my mic to uh, Madam Chair, like I, I'd like to give a brief introduction about all the participants. Uh, uh, Deepa, Ambassador Deepa uh, Vagwan has been a distinguished career diplomat in the Indian Foreign Service. She was the first Indian woman to be appointed as an ambassador to the Gulf of State of Qatar and later Japan. Uh, she also been ambassador to Sweden, Latvia, and Republic of Martian Island. Uh, she is going to chair the session. Uh, it's a pleasure to invite you, ma'am, for this webinar. And I hope that uh, we'll be able to gain some uh, knowledge about Japanese investment in India. And uh, special remarks, uh, Mr. Toshida Anto-san, a minister and deputy chief of mission in India, Embassy of Japan, New Delhi. Uh, welcome you again, sir, uh, for this uh, webinar. Uh, uh, the, uh, the next speaker will be uh, Mr. Sagata Bhattacharya, Chief Economist, Axis Bank, uh, a well-known financial expert with more than 15 years of experience. Uh, Mr. Bhattacharya is often quoted on varieties of monetary policy and financial market issues. Uh, Bhattacharya was member of the Finance Minister subgroup on estimating foreign savings uh, for the approach paper for the 12th five-year plan. Uh, sir will be speaking on uh, investment climate in India. And uh, the, speaker, the, the final speaker is Dr. Shabani Rai Chaudhary, a professor in Japanese studies at Center for East Asian Studies, School of International Studies, Jawaharlal Nehru University, New Delhi. Uh, Professor, Professor Chaudhary is an expert in Japanese investment and also visiting fellow to ASI Japan's Minister, Ministry for Economics and Industry and Policy Research Institute, Japan Ministry of Finance. Uh, uh, Professor uh, Chaudhary will speak on Japanese investment in India. Uh, I kindly request Ambassador Deepa Vagwa to deliver her opening remarks and also chair the session. Uh, the audience can send their question, me in the chat box. Uh, so at the end of the session, we are, we'll have a question answer session and I'll be asking the questions. So uh, please be very specific when uh, addressing the speaker. Uh, so I'll stop here and I will ask Ambassador Ma'am to chair this session. Thank you, Ma'am. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Pani Selvam. Am I audible? Yes, Ma'am. Okay. I'm really grateful to NIAS and the ISSSP for organizing this very topically, topically pertinent webinar on the impact of COVID on the FDI regime and um, uh, with a focus on Japanese investments in India. Uh, as you've just heard from the introductions, we have a very good panel of experts to speak on the subject. And uh, I would request each of them to speak for about 15 minutes. And after which, um, as uh, Dr. Pani Selvam has mentioned, there will be a question answer session. I would again uh, request all those asking questions, please indicate who the questions are directed to. Um, I'm very honored to uh, chair this session. Uh, Japan is very, very dear to me. Uh, I was fortunate to be the ambassador there uh, during a very good period of our relations. And this really continues. It's a very, very special relationship that India has with Japan. A special word of thanks to His Excellency, um, Mr. Toshihide Ando, the Deputy Chief of Mission of the Japanese Embassy in uh, Delhi, for finding the time from his busy schedule and being here with us. As you know, we rescheduled this because there were some technical glitches. And he made sure that he found time again in his, uh, in his schedule to come here and address us. So we're really grateful to you. We do realize the terrible 
sort of pressures under which diplomats are functioning in these days of the pandemic. Permit me to say a few words on the subject. Um, you know, there is no life of, no aspect of human life which has been unaffected by this totally unanticipated and unprecedented uh, onslaught of the COVID-19 pandemic. The global economic environment, which was already experiencing a slowdown pre the pandemic, as well as headwinds against globalization, which was originating um, to a large extent due to, due to policies under the Trump uh, presidency, has found the process of, dec uh, of decline accelerated uh, by this pandemic. According to a recent report by McKinsey, uh, governments worldwide have put in almost $13 trillion to uh, restart, stabilize the economies and restart um, growth. Uh, the two countries in focus today, that is India and Japan, have announced stimulus packages valued at about 21.7% of the GDP in the case of Japan and about 10% of GDP in the case of India. The pandemic has caused massive upheaval in the flow of FDI too, as both supply and demand have been affected by the containment measures forced uh, on countries due to this very fast spread of, of, this, um, uh, of, of COVID-19, uh, causing disruption in global production networks and supply chains. This in turn has, I think, exposed the degree of interconnectedness um, of the flow of goods, goods and services, causing countries uh, directly affected by the di disruption in these uh, supply chains to seriously revamp economic strategies and reduce their, uh, uh, their vulnerability, their national vulnerabilities to global economic setbacks and shocks. Amtad says that global FDI uh, outflows will decrease by 30 to 40% in the coming year, that is 2021. Uh, as can be expected, I think developing countries will bear the brunt of this, they'd be more affected. But I think India, though a developing country, you know, we are in a special category by, our, by ourselves, as we will hear from the speakers later. But we will see, on one hand, growing competition to attract FDI from high-income countries, especially in manufacturing, like in countries like in India, and simultaneously a rejigging of global value chains to encourage greater production at home, reshoring, as they call it. Many countries have also tightened FDI screening mechanisms to protect domestic companies, which may become easy targets for takeovers due to an erosion of market capitalization. Such measures have been adopted both by Japan and India, and also other countries in Europe as well as Australia. In most cases, the concern arises due to, uh, as much due to China's quick recovery, despite being the origin of the pandemic, and worries about sectors uh, which in national economies, which are important uh, in terms of security and public order. These actions taken by uh, governments have included uh, insisting on governmental, prior governmental uh, approval for FDI, uh, setting uh, limits to FDI, and identifying sensitive sec sectors. In the case of Japan, the government has called for a reshoring of companies where the dependence on a single country is high for critically important goods of high value added production. And for diversification of supply chains in the case of others uh, who are not in this category to third countries. And in this course, I think ASEAN was mentioned more as an example. Japan has also placed restrictions on FDI in key high technology areas to monitor investments from China. Um, and you know what we have done, what India has done in, in the past few weeks, I think there's been action on many fronts. In this context, Japan announced a stimulus package of uh, $2.2 billion for reshoring companies from China and, and diversifying, diversifying supply chains dependent on China. This announcement, which provides a monetary stimulus uh, to the existing China plus one policy, has been welcomed in India where relations with Japan, as I mentioned earlier, is really a cornerstone of our foreign policy, and Japan is the third largest investor in terms of FDI into India. This has raised hopes that as the pandemic also exposed vulnerabilities of Japanese companies already in India, um, due to their dependence on China, on Chinese um, located um, supply chains. And given the pull factor, the factor of the large Indian market, uh, there will logically be a move for such companies to relocate 
to India and start production in India. Of course, for that, India has to take a slew of measures to make our uh, investment environment more friendly. Uh, this, of course, fits in well with India's own recently announced strategy of Atmanirbhar Bharat. Um, and we, I, I will stop here and, and uh, you know, let the, uh, let the expert array of speakers address the specifics. Before giving the floor to um, uh, His Excellency um, Ambassador Ando for his special address, let me briefly again recap that India and Japan in the last two decades has established a very, very strong, not only strong, but a sustainable relationship, which is based on very wide public support, wide political support, complementarities in our economies, convergences in political and security interests. And we have a very multi-layered um, uh, infrastructure kind of uh, superstructure of cooperation you know, where we talk across the board on a large number of issues and of this I think the economic cooperation is a very very important pillar so we look forward to the special address and special remarks by Mr. Toshihide Ando. Ando-san over to you. So you have to unmute. Unmute. Mute. Okay. Okay. I'm not sorry. I'm not used to uh, this uh, Zoom system. Yes. <laughs> so thank you, thank you, Ambassador Wadwa, for a kind introduction, and uh, uh, thanks for having me at this uh, webinar on uh, impact of COVID-19 on FDI regime and Japanese investment in India. I think uh, this is a very timely topic, uh, as we hear a lot of enthusiasm on the part of Indians for more Japanese investment which we uh, warmly welcome. And uh, before I talk, to, talk about this topic, I'd like to uh, express sincere respect for all the professional medicals, medical professionals and uh, staffs, government officials and others who are tirelessly working uh, to uh, respond to the COVID-19 crisis. And I understand that India is uh, going through tough times as are the other countries like Japan but I'm confident that India will come out strong after this crisis. Um, let me say a few words about uh, Japan-India relationship that as uh, Ambassador Wadua outlined that uh, our relations have never been stronger. We are now special strategic and global partners. We share common values like uh, rule of law and democracy. We share uh, strategic objectives in the region. We are both committed to a free and open Indo-Pacific we are working together to maintain a uh, rule-based order uh, by enhancing maritime security and uh, uh, connectivity. And our defense cooperation extends to uh, 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 two plus two uh, ministerial framework, which is foreign, and foreign affairs and defense. And uh, we have now uh, uh, joint exercises of all the three forces, Army, Navy, and Air Force. And we have a uh, uh, technological uh, cooperation uh, on uh, uh, defense equipment. Uh, as far as our economic uh, relationship is concerned, um, it is very broad and robust, with Japan supporting a, uh, Prime Minister Modi's uh, Make in India and uh, Skill India. And uh, we understand the foundation of this relationship uh, is uh, lies in the vigorous activities of the private sectors of both countries. And uh, I think this is a topic of this discussion today. Uh, Japan has been the third largest foreign uh, direct invest investor to India after Mauritius and uh, in, uh, Singapore. And the number of Japanese companies uh, operating in India is steadily increasing uh, from actually 812 in 2011 to 1441 4, 1, in 2018. But I think there is a common understanding maybe among many uh, looking at India-Japan relations that this economic relation has not yet reached its true potential. We think we can do more. So how is a point. And I think there are two important points that I like made at this point. Uh, the first is that uh, India and Japan, I think need to be embedded in the global value chain. This is why Japan has been consistently supporting India's participation in RCEP, RCEP. And secondly, uh, India needs to uh, improve its business environment. 
we, we think that in India is now uh, ranked at number 63 by the World Bank in terms of a business climate, which has been upgraded for the past years. And we uh, acknowledge improvements we have seen in the uh, Indian business climate. But uh, if we look at ASEAN countries, uh, such as Malaysia, which is number 12, uh, Thailand, number 21, we can do much more uh, to do uh, to improve the business environment. And uh, in this context, as I said at the beginning, I'm quite, uh, we welcome India's increasing interest in more Japanese investment in the middle of COVID-19 crisis. And we think the, challenge, uh, the situation in India is challenging, but Japanese companies are resolved to restart their operations and contribute to the economic development of India uh, in the post COVID-19 period. Indeed, some Japanese companies have, uh, have already resumed the operations. And uh, this is thanks to the support of the uh, central and many state governments. But many others are still uh, facing challenges, struggling to rebooting their business. Uh, and another point I'd like to make, as the uh, Ambassador Bado mentioned, that uh, we have seen strong awareness of the need to reduce supply chain risks in Japan, in India, in everywhere especially for strategic goods. So this is of course triggered by global restrictions on cross-border traffic in response to COVID-19 pandemic. Therefore, it is possible that an increasing number of companies may now reconsider their existing manufacturing units and consider new investments to diversify their production base. So this means that we might be presented with a new opportunity in Indian Japan if, and uh, this if is very important, that if we act together quickly in the right way. So that is why we are asking now, uh, asking India uh, rather than later to drastically improve the uh, business climate. So more Japanese companies will be encouraged to consider for investment in India. And timing is critical. If we do not act now, if we do not act in the right direction, the, our opportunity could be lost to other countries, somewhere the business environment be more favorable than India at this point. And another point I'd like to make is that healthcare environment, uh, the extensive spread of COVID-19 in India has revealed the importance of strengthening the healthcare environment. Well, I'm afraid to say that many Japanese expatriates have uh, expressed concern over uncertainty in the medical and healthcare system in India. And according to one survey, that a striking 80% of the Japanese companies located in India have either already evacuated from India or were preparing to do so. So this figure is clearly larger than that of Japanese companies in China and Malaysia, which are about 20%, and Titan, which is about 10%. So this shows that comprehensive and advanced medical services are key, especially now. So uh, I think now is the time for India and Japan to act together for promoting more Japanese investment in India. So in this context, uh, our embassy, Embassy of Japan, JCCII, which is Japan uh, Chamber of Commerce and Industry in India, and JETRO, which is Japan External Trade Organization, have recently come up with the uh, uh, requests and recommendations on the business environment in India. Uh, let me uh, uh, share with you some of the recommendations they have in this uh, uh, paper. Um, uh, these are such as uh, enhancement of the economic package for MSMEs, relaxation of ECB, external commercial borrowings regulations, reviews on labor laws, reduction of the GST rate, immediate transfer of pending tax refunds, installment of Japan help desk in every state. I think it's already some states have already uh, Japan help desk, which are very useful. Provision of access to a healthcare environment and improvement and stabilization in power, road and water infrastructure. So those are the recommendations or requests from the uh, Japanese companies. And uh, at the same time, Japan on its part has uh, helped India improve its uh, business environment over the years. Uh, we have an extended assistance in, uh, uh, in terms of infrastructure, including uh, roads and railways, uh, medical healthcare systems. Uh, we have created Japan industrial townships, so, and so forth. 
And uh, as you know, indeed, Japan has been the largest donor for India, and Japan, India has been the largest recipient of Japanese assistance. And recently, in, in, uh, in terms of response to COVID-19, we are considering to provide health and medical equipment to India. Uh, so we will continue our efforts in this regard, and I hope this will, uh, uh, this will facilitate um, uh, investment in, in India. And also, uh, I like to mention what Ambassador Wado mentioned about the new uh, program in, uh, occurring in Japan. I think I assume that many state governments and central government are very interested in this program for strengthening overseas supply chains. Uh, this is based on, of course, COVID-19 experience. Um, Japan has found it necessary to establish a sustainable and reliable supply system through diversification of the production base, especially in the Asia region. So for this purpose, Japan budgeted 23.5 billion yen uh, which is to be introduced as part of Japan and ASEAN Economic Cooperation. But the introduction of production facilities outside of ASEAN, including India, would be eligible for this program if they are evaluated as being effective in achieving the policy objective. And uh, these include, of course, cases where the diversification of production based outside ASEAN contributes to more resilient supply chains in Japan and ASEAN. So uh, uh, now in closing, I'd like to stress that uh, promoting Japanese investment in India in the new post-COVID-19 world requires joint efforts, both Indian and Japanese. So it is critical that we sit not idle, just waiting for a, a new opportunity to fall upon us, but act jointly and proactively to see this opportunity to tremendous efforts on both sides. And as I said at the beginning, uh, uh, we are confident that India will come out strong after this crisis. So uh, uh, let us upgrade our economic relationship to a high level or the new normal. And thank you very much. Uh, Ma'am, you have to unmute. unmute. Uh, thank you very much, Andersan, for your special remarks, which, you know, you have very realistically um, place India-Japan relations in perspective. A lot of your points you make are extremely relevant. I think we have to hear, we would, uh, you know, and consider these recommendations which have come from JETRO and JCCII who work in India. I think this is really important. Um, also, one is aware that a very large number of the Japanese in uh, India did leave after this pandemic broke because, uh, you know, of a lack of, uh, uh, I think, um, faith in the healthcare system in India. So maybe this is a sector in which we would love to have the Japanese in India and to upgrade our healthcare system, uh, including uh, in, in uh, production, manufacture, medical devices, etc. The whole, you know, the whole gamut. Uh, it would be interest. It would be important to work with Japan. Um, it's good to also hear that the, uh, the companies are restarting. People are coming back. And generally, I know that I like your approach, which is very constructive and say that there are new opportunities. This is the moment. And I think both sides should work together to make sure that we can certainly ensure that there is greater FDI from India and, uh, you know, where uh, both our, our policies of Atmanirbhar Bharat as well as uh, Japan's uh, policy to diversify uh, supply chains, they, they coincide. So thank you very, very much. Really appreciate it. Um, our next speaker is Mr. Sagata Bhattacharya, Chief Economist of the Axis Bank. He will speak on the investment climate in India. As we know, India since 1991 has focused on liberalizing the FDI regime. This has met with some success in the last two decades and FDI flows into India as per Invest India has been about $642 billion uh, um, in the last two decades from the beginning um, of the century. Half of which apparently, that is about $320 billion, came in the past five years. So India continues to be an attractive destination for FDI. Um, but what we have seen post the COVID-19 pandemic, which has hit India just as hard, uh, because it was already experiencing an economic slowdown, um, has made us realize that there is need for a stimulus package uh, and, you know, we have in some ways a sort of repackage, I think, our Make in India policy. Uh, I, I really look forward to uh, what Dr. Bhattacharya has to say, particularly in terms of feelings around that. Is this Atmanirbhar um, 
policy, Atmanirbhar Bharat policy, is it protectionist? I think government has taken pain to say it is not. So we look forward to hear your views on it and how FDI into India stands. Over to you, Dr. Patichari. Uh, thank you so much. Thank you so much. I, I think uh, what a privilege to be uh, part of this discussion. Uh, again, as I as I mentioned, uh, I'm I'm not uh, uh, I'm not going to talk about Japan. Uh, I'm here to learn on uh, in the Japanese uh, collaboration cooperation. Obviously, I mean it's very very deep. I mean anybody who's seen the metro uh, work in in, in Mumbai uh, knows the extent of investments and involvement of Japan. Anybody who's seen the dedicated freight corridors in India that are being built knows the extent of uh, Japanese investments in, in India. Uh, so let me just begin. I'll, I'll keep it very brief, uh, about 10 minutes, 12 minutes. Uh, to my mind, investment climate, one, uh, is the here and now, uh, the macro environment, uh, including very important as of this point in time, the path uh, that we see for recovery. Uh, second is the access to credit and finance, because credit and finance is the basic bottom line of which the equity component, as uh, we are all talking about, is the FDI component. Uh, and then third, uh, strategies to execute. Execution is, as usual, key uh, to execute growth and competitiveness policies. Uh, let me quickly start with the macro environment. So this crisis was a very unusual confluence of uh, what I thought were four Cs. Uh, credit, COVID, crude, and confidence. Uh, of course, now there is a fifth one, which is China. Uh, so, but uh, we have already entered this crisis in a in an already weakened uh, uh, growth and, and growth environment. Uh, GDP growth from about eight uh, percent in in 2018 uh, has very rapidly come down uh, to four uh, percent in in FY20 last year. Uh, we think it's likely to be anywhere between minus four to minus five percent. Uh, the deal now is to try to get a V-shaped recovery as much as possible. Difficult. Yeah, there are multiple obstacles. Difficult, but we let's try uh, to see where we can go into a five percent odd uh, growth back in in uh, 2021 and 22. The greater concern now, not just growth, is capex, is investment. Uh, so growth slowdown that we have seen uh, is was largely due to falling investment. Uh, manufacturing RBI survey shows that manufacturing capacity utilization, even in December of, of 2019, uh, had come down to about uh, 64, 65%. Uh, this was in December. Imagine what capacity utilization is likely to be now. Uh, so obviously a large part of the, of the recovery strategy uh, has to be investment in, in public infrastructure. Uh, because corporate investments are unlikely to happen uh, in this environment, particularly with the fourth C confidence having been a problem. This is this is really unfortunate because I mean, in, in as late as FY19 and probably even last year, uh, the H1 of FY20, uh, there were signs that corporate balance sheets, bank balance sheets, uh, the levels of non-performing assets, non-performing loans, bad loans, stressed assets in the system had been improving. Uh, so again, unfortunately, there is likely to be a reversal uh, in the next couple of years. We need to manage this. Uh, I'm not going to talk too much on the policy stimulus. Uh, I'm uh, on the, that, that's already come about. Uh, I, I, I think, uh, ma'am, your, your uh, uh, views on Atmanivar Bharat, I, I think it's very right. Uh, let's wait and watch uh, how this evolves over a period of time. Uh, so I, I think, from what I understand, we are likely to see two components. One uh, is to increase India's uh, internal competitiveness. So that's one very important part. And second, resilience. I think what this crisis has shown us uh, is that there's the need for resilience in the, in the system, which is very, very important. Uh, so that's one very, two components of the Atmanivar Bharat, but that has to be overlaid on a certain overtone of well, I mean, cha national champion companies, techno-nationalism, et cetera, that seems to be one pillar of the Atmanirbhar program. Uh, this needs to be, to be managed and merged uh, with the global move towards new value chain, uh, uh, value chain structures, et cetera. So the policy stimulus obviously has three components, which is the survive, revive, and thrive. Uh, so right now, till the last couple of months, it was focused on survival. 
so the current program, the uh, the ten percent of GDP, the twenty trillion rupee uh, package, is designed to revive. And then the next set of measures is the thrive, which is exactly what we are uh, I'm, I'm focus uh, more on. So, which is the execution strategy? As we all know from all the management jargon, that I mean, we might have as many strategies as we want, unless we implement effectively, uh, we are not going to go anywhere. We need to quickly get back into the six to seven percent growth. So, we need a very, very new look at policies and strategies. So, the first part is the Atma Nirbhar Bharat. I've just talked about this. Uh, the point. In, in this is we need a lot of investment uh, to fund infra and, and other investments uh, to get back to the 6-7% uh, uh, growth levels. Uh, estimates are anywhere between $1.5 trillion, $1.5 trillion every year for the next 5 to 10 years of investments that we need. Uh, by the way, India's GDP is now approximately $3 trillion, might be a little lower uh, in the next coming years. So we need uh, access to foreign capital pools. Our domestic uh, financial savings, our uh, total financial savings, household, corporate, government, etc., uh, is about $500 billion uh, every year, uh, likely to be a bit lower. So we need access to global capital pools. That's a, that's a given. Uh, as, as you mentioned, ma'am, we have done a fairly decent job in, in attracting uh, FDI. We have got 72 billion gross FDI flows in, in FY20 versus about $64 uh, billion dollars the year before. Uh, and a lot of it is now coming in into startups, into the new economy uh, that, that, that we are seeing. Uh, the, the P, PC type of investments, which is also a large part of which is considered to be FDI. But we do need to do much, much more. Much smaller companies are getting more FDI than India's. Uh, so there is the move towards a global repositioning of, of supply chains. Uh, multiple changes will happen in the next cup in, in the next few years uh, in business models, uh, in in the, in the new configuration of supply chains, the move towards digital, uh, new ways of working, etc. Uh, India is already a very, very data intensive uh, economy now. I mean, data, uh, that's, so, the, so the supply chains have permeated across multiple into tier two, tier three cities, large warehouses are being set up. So our data environment has become very intense. So obviously, I mean, there's a huge uh, element of, of investment potential that, that we can now get. However, uh, manufacturing in India has been fairly stunted. I mean, you know, a couple of years back, the economic survey pointed this out, uh, stunted companies. Uh, and and uh, so a lot uh, in MSMEs, which are not scaling up into the mid-sized companies uh, that are the most effective across the world. I mean, combining the agility of uh, MSMEs into the processes uh, of larger companies, that's not happening to the extent that we, that we look for. Uh, there are Trends in business models, which are which is consolidation in every sector that you see, you're already beginning to see signs now. One or two large companies are likely to uh, dominate across sectors, monopolies, oligopolies, a few few companies, large company, but that that consolidation will happen. You're, you're already seeing, which calls for very strong policies on competition. One and a very strong regulatory uh, infrastructure. I mean, you know, we need to rethink the entire models of competition and, and regulation going in from here. In this context, I just want to mention uh, a, some, some numbers that we saw, uh, a comparison of foreign value added in India's exports. India's exports do not have a very large value added if you take out petroleum, because we import a lot of crude and export a lot of petrol products. So if you take that out, it's not very large. But within this context, China's value added, foreign value added in India's exports has risen from about 3%, foreign value added, not, not total exports, uh, 3% in 2009 to 15% in 2014 to 35% in 2019. In comparison, Japan's share has fallen from 4.5% in 2014 to 2.5% in 2019. India's share in China's foreign value added uh, has gone from about 2% to about 2.9% during this period. So just as a, as a sense of how we need to uh, reconfigure the, our, 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 our positioning in the, in the supply chains. China seemingly has a low share in India's FDI, relatively including from Hong Kong, it seems to be about 
less than uh, $6 billion. Difficult to estimate FDI because always, I mean, you know, I mean, there are other uh, sources, Mauritius, other, other sources, difficult to estimate, but I mean, it's not, not been very large. Uh, but however, a key shift in, in India's FDI uh, and, and in activity uh, going forward will be the shift to the digital channels and platforms. And Chinese companies and investors over here uh, have acquired a very large share in startups, marketplaces, fintechs, uh, you name it. I mean, you know all the companies. I mean, ATM, Policy Bazaar, Flipkart, Baiju, Swiggy, Somato, Hike. I mean, you, you go on and on on, on, on this. The good thing to note over here is that SoftBank has been a visionary leader and has been a very active participant in, in, in this area. So the world is now awash in central banking induced liquidity, which is seeking returns all over the world. Uh, you, you've just seen uh, uh, looking for attractive valuations, Indian valuation, company valuations, where the M&A potential is very, very attractively valued now. Investors are still very bullish on India's macros because obviously I mean, it's a large market. So attracting foreign capital not be very difficult if business models are right and government policies pertaining to the sector uh, are perceived to be balanced. Uh, so again, I mean, you don't need to mention the recent rush that you've seen, one to one point five billion dollar, and still going on uh, even yesterday. Uh, so still going on into one company, one single company, and a lot of other investments are coming up into other digital platforms. As I mentioned, data centers. I mean, imagine the amount of digital transformation that will happen in the amount of data that will be needed uh, to, to, to service that digital economy. Data centers, data centers, R&D, I mean, the, 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 and actually, I mean, one of the areas, despite the falling investments in India before the crisis, uh, was in the commercial real estate. Companies across each and every multinational company in the world, I mean, from Silicon Valley, you, you name the company, they had brought in various uh, functions into India, not just the, the KPO, BPO type things, more advanced research and development, R&D, uh, more front-facing banking functions, etc. So all of that. Uh, next investment cycle to my mind uh, is the ESG space, without doubt. The global investors will be unrelenting in, 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 in looking at the ESG component in all the investments. I know Japan will be particularly invested, whether it be from Canada, from Australia, from Europe, the ESG component. Environment, E, um, sanitation, sewage disposal, landfills, drinking water. I mean, the potential is endless, but we need to be very careful because, I mean, we need to fund. I mean, the cash flows that, that come in from this will need to be, the, the debt that we needs to be serviced will need cash flows that will need uh, innovative user charges, etc., which we haven't done all this while. So that's one. Social. Extremely important community involvement in large long gestation infra projects, road projects, say for instance, the more the community gets involved in the project, the more sustainable the project, the less risky the project becomes, the more the potential to attract foreign investments. So E, G, and G, I don't need to, to mention to go on, on G, what we have seen over the last uh, couple of years. So where should the government now focus? Uh, obviously, healthcare, as everybody mentioned, uh, Andosan also mentioned. I mean, I, I think that's a, a no-brainer. The sheer inadequacy of even the soft healthcare infrastructure, not just the hospitals and the ventilators, uh, the lack of doctors, nurses, etc. So that needs to be ramped up. Logistics, India's logistics, and logistics has been the bane of India's investment, uh, India's ease of doing business. Uh, logistics costs in India, and Gadkari uh, Sahab uh, keeps on uh, talking about this. That is between 13 to 14 percent. All our peer competitors are in the single digits. We need to move into this. Investments in warehouses, etc. Uh, national, the national investment, infrastructure investment on NIF uh, has been focusing on this. And, and, and that involves a lot of MSMEs. I mean, you know, the, the, the vendors into, this, into the warehousing projects, the, the distribution structure. Uh, that's a very, very MSME-centric part. Three, finally, I'll, I'll stop over here. Uh, the coordination between center and states. So most EODB reforms, ease of doing business reforms that are now are largely in the domain of states. There are some central parts, taxes, legal, judicial reforms, some regulatory reforms, et cetera, the international trade part, uh, customs, et cetera. Uh, but the deepest reforms in electricity, land, labor, business permits, et cetera, are all in the domain of states. So now in the immediate future, I mean, we need to get the migrants back into the centers of business. So that's something which is coordination. So coordination to my mind is, is absolutely must. 
finally i think we are we are showing a, a significant amount of innovation in the regulatory infrastructure regulation very very important at this point in time uh, we just i just heard yesterday of a uh, of a regulatory sandbox uh, project in in insurance uh, when in uh, coming in from irda and and the rbi has, has started sebi has started there is a a deeper coordination between regulators in this new digital environment so that's one part and i'm i'm very hopeful that i mean given india's strengths that we will do well but the need is to get moving quickly on this so that we don't lose uh, to other countries in this global reconfiguration thank you so much i'm so sorry i've, I've exceeded my time really really apologies Thank, thank you, uh, Dr. Bhattacharya. No, you haven't exceeded your time. We could keep on listening to you. This is absolutely fascinating. This overview that you gave, it's so informative, you know. You put so many pieces together to give a larger picture because we read bits and pieces. But I think um, one thing that I did see that there's a lot of hope that, you know, that there is a possibility, but of course we have to get our acts together. I think the, uh, the sectors that you have identified, healthcare, logistics, um, coordination between uh, center and states. I think these are very, very important areas we have to look at. And you already mentioned uh, the ESG sector. Uh, this is one area where, you know, the Japanese have already been partnering us, particularly through its JICA pro, uh, projects. And um, whether it's logistics or whether it's building of infrastructure, you know, they've been such a reliable partner. The big infrastructure corridors, we have the DMIC, the CBIC, Chennai Bangalore Industrial Corridor, you know, they have been a very, very great partner, but I think we've got to intensify this in a more focused way. And yes, and you know, really focus on manufacturing because if there is no manufacturing, how in the world are we going to be able to give jobs to the millions who actually have suffered now and the numbers that are increasing uh, among the unemployed in India? So there is that important uh, you know, focus also that we have. Thank you. It was really, really extremely, extremely um, interesting and for me also extremely informative, I'm sure. Uh, that's what everybody else who's here, who's hearing you will, uh, will agree. So uh, now uh, we are on to our next speaker, is Professor Shabani Roy Chowdhury. I frankly do not know anyone as knowledgeable on the India-Japan economic relationship and as committed to realize the potential of this relationship as Professor Roy, Ch uh, Roy Chowdhury. Um, you know, she... Uh, for me, in fact, um, you know, seeing it more from a practitioner's point of view, uh, as ambassador, uh, there has been very important to also get her inputs and her understanding, her understanding of not only the now, but also the history, and how we reached here and what the future can be. So we look forward to hearing from uh, Professor Roy Chaudhry. Shabani, over to you. Thank you. Uh, I hope I'm audible. Yeah. Um, yeah, um, being the last speaker, it always gives one an advantage to see how the flow of conversation or what the direction of the whole uh, seminar is. So it's interesting. I'll just give a brief about what has been our past experience uh, between India-Japan's relations and then move on to looking at the, obviously, the two strong areas, leaving away the trade because trade is a different uh, ball game altogether and much more complicated today. Uh, especially because we're looking at uh, comprehensive economic partnership agreements, certain changes such that we are able to push the trade forward. I would limit myself to looking basically on the investment front. Uh, Prakash, the next slide, please. Uh, if you see the landmark between Japan and India relationship, I, to the panelists, I don't think anyone uh, needs this. It is more to the attendees out here. Uh, India-Japan's relationship, initially everyone sort of hinged it mainly on the economic front and uh, there was a lot of uh, interest with respect to, uh, you know, uh, India taking advantage of its liberalization and encouraging Japanese participation and therefore, you know, Maruti being the first one that uh, sort of uh, gave visibility to Japanese um, product in India and thereof we took off and, you know, today as uh, Every one of us say that there is a lot of touch and visibility of Japanese investment in in uh, terms of metro system or the infrastructure developments. But this entire uh, move uh, between Japan and India uh, is today uh, moved beyond 
just looking at private uh, investments in automobile and in uh, electronics to some kind of an integrated between the ODA and the FDI that flows into our countries, very similar to what happened in the ASEAN countries. Next slide, please. Uh, however, over the between 2014 and 18, if you look at the kind of approach that has happened towards these investments, there is a component of strategic um, uh, uh, aspect, essentially with terms of how India gains its, um, its importance in the geopolitical system, the Indo-Pacific um, becoming the major area of um, operations as far as strategic component goes. But what is interesting in this whole uh, relationship is while you have a strategic component building up over time, there is obviously the focus has to has always been through the economic diplomacy. And therefore, you see a much more a, you know, stronger emphasis on ODA, uh, which has essentially uh, reached a, a, a quantum with becoming the number, India becoming the number one country. We'll have a look at it as I move on to with the presentation. But what is also important is how both the, um, you know, for at the policy making level, how both the countries look towards how to create synergies, for instance, India's make in uh, India being incorporated into the Japan, India make in India and special financial facility that was therefore given to the point of $12, uh, $12 billion. Uh, Prakash, the next slide, please. And subsequently, if you look at it, we've had two very important uh, developments. One is our civil nuclear cooperation. And of course, currently, if you look at the 2018, and unfortunately, we haven't had the two, uh, beyond that, we haven't had any uh, Prime Minister's meeting. Uh, we did have uh, establishment of towards this more of a strategic end of uh, the, the spectrum that is a dialogue in foreign ministers as well as defense ministry and commencement of talk on military logistic packs and of course reaching out to the south asian region but therefore today if you look at how where japan stands uh, with respect to indian bilateral relations i think it is one of the most sustainable and most um, comfortable relationship, both in terms of um, at the government level, as well as at the ministerial level and uh, even to the state level. What is interesting uh, development that has happened between 2014 and 18 is a realization by the Japanese investors that uh, you know, reaching out to the state governments of India is an important factor. And I know how uh, Ambassador Vadva has worked in creating this understanding, which was something that which was a huge bottleneck for Japanese investments coming into India. Next slide, Prakash. If you look at, therefore, the institutional actors that we have in both the countries, you would notice that there is, seems to be a lot of parallelities with respect to the uh, investment act in institutional actors and these actors are uh, in coordination with each other and therefore today uh, unlike say the 2000 when a Japanese in private investor coming into India would have had problems of where to reach out whom to reach out there are a lot of institutional actors in place for instance in India we have the India Japan investment promotion partnership in which you have both um, ministerial level uh, 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 officers of Japan stationed in India under the Japan Plus team and Invest India Forum, which has a special Japan desk, so which has people. And then we have offices of both Jebek, Jaika, and Jetro stationed in India, trying to partner with India uh, with respect to attracting the private foreign uh, direct investment from Japan. So, as far as institutional actors go, I think we are comfortably placed, especially in the post-pandemic uh, um, post-pandemic zone, when we move towards trying to get take advantage of the changes that is going to happen in India, and therefore leverage on it to push push for both official development assistance as well as FDI. Official development assistance, the um, but, uh, the statistical data is tremendously in favor of India and we are now number one. But what is importantly two things that I would like to draw your attention to with ODA is the kind of strong infrastructure investments that is going in through the JICA um, platform. And this is essentially been because in the 
initially between 2000 till around 2012 13 major uh, reason of given by japanese investors in india with respect to the uh, business environment had been the infrastructure and therefore both india and japan government had taken it up at the joint um, uh, at the joint statement level and it allowed for japanese investors uh, investment in this particular aspect and today we therefore look forward to two very big corridors you know in the, the the dmic corridor which will probably be one of the largest um, you know financially committed uh, corridor for both uh, for japan and it would look seen it would be connecting up a large number of six states which should with the smart city concept that has been developed around the corridor would lead to a disbursement of the kind that you're seeing right now in your uh, screen what is important about uh, the oda investment and which is why japan's investment into india is actually appreciated by the Indian counterpart is the fact that it is looks at quality in which therefore there is an embedment of technology transfers. We, they look at inclusivity and reliance, which is something that uh, resilience, which is something that even Sogata brought into the uh, conversation. And therefore, we do have, uh, uh, you know, as we move towards the post pandemic uh, uh, scenario, we assume that the ODA would actually contribute strongly to giving us the kind of platforms in which we require uh, in uh, global financial investments. As far as foreign direct investment goes, it has been pretty you know, erratic, as I would always say. It's climbed up and down. And uh, post um, the CEPA, there was a huge uh, move towards um, as uh, ever private investors into uh, India, but then we've had those years when we've not had a very great outing. If you look at even the business companies that have come into India, we could see that, uh, Prakash, the next slide, please. We would see a, you know, laterally a very nice um, northward move. But interestingly, uh, what could be the reason for um, these companies, um, uh, the number and what you see at ground level is that some companies are essentially at an office level and not having started their production out here. Uh, what is important is uh, having created the synergy between state level and prefecture level understanding. We have seen a large number of state governments now actively playing a role of doing the Japanese um, uh, investors into India, especially strong roles have been played from Gujarat, from uh, Andhra Pradesh, Karnataka, and these days, in, uh, if you see the recent developments, Northeast, which has become a focus area for both India and Japan with respect to even business investments. If you look at uh, attracting the uh, FDI inflow from Japan, what is interesting is that you could see a sector that has started growing, which is the drug and pharmaceutical sector, uh, which is taken over from uh, auto automobile industry. And this is a right move. And I think the pandemic situation would essentially encourage uh, this sector to uh, grow largely uh, with respect to India, Japan's invest Japan's investors in India. Uh, but of course, uh, today, the you know visibility of japanese investment private investment comes on uh, from the automobile sector but what is in, uh, what is important uh, to understand is in the automobile sector the major two lo locations has been the north location you know, that is gurgaon and um, uh, delhi uh, rajasthan till nimrana and on the other side it has been karnataka tamil nadu and some western states uh, one western state that is gujarat but what is interesting with the development of automobile as well as electronic sector investment in India is while the big companies came into India, the SMEs which usually tagged and went with respect to ASEAN countries did not come to India because alternative of SMEs within India was often available for these uh, big companies, the Japanese companies. And therefore, the support that SMEs got when they moved to in, uh, ASEAN countries in the uh, form of a you know tag along process and the production network that was created did not happen in India and that is the particularly the reason why today we are looking at public public uh, private partnership to push 
this um, SMB sector of Japan to uh, entice them to come into India because it is the it is these companies which are actually the heart and soul of growth of skill development which could happen in India rather than the big companies that we see uh, who are essentially uh, looking uh, at uh, getting the components from either China or from um, other ASEAN countries into India and therefore only assembling it out here and resending it across to the other rest of the world and so therefore the SME sector attracting SME sector could probably become the major area of concern when we move towards trying to engage Japan investors in India in the post-pandemic environment. But what is also very interesting and is a good sign is the sectoral investment that has moved beyond the electronic and automobile industry. And that is, that it is not only in consumables, pharmaceutical, telecoms, food processing, and renewables, a mix of sectoral investments, some which are going to be strongly into the knowledge-based sector, uh, and some which are going to be in the traditional sector gives Japan's diversity in the FDI um, uh, engagement. But if you look at where we stand today, the key point is that FDI still continu continues to be a puzzle uh, for India with respect to uh, attraction, uh, attracting Japanese investment simply because in spite of an engaging relationship at political level, engaging relationship uh, with respect to economic diplomacy level, Japan's investment lags um, in India lags behind China, countries like Vietnam, Indonesia and Thailand. In views of the joint statement that Prime Ministers um, have therefore been constantly referring to this and devising means to address this as you've seen creating more institutional actors which could enable hand-holding exercises for Japanese investors as well as promoting India in Japan. So concerns of Japanese investors even today by the 2019 uh, JPEG report continues to be the institutional transparency, finance with taxation with respect to movement of investments uh, uh, and approvals, land acquisition and of course the regional and state divide of understanding why some states are actually more attractive than other states continues to be a problem for Japanese investors. And that is something that has been reflected through and through through the JPEG reports that we get every year. Uh, but the pandemic has created a new equation and much talked about is the production network. The production network history is interesting. Uh, what happened initially was Japanese investment, uh, Japanese production system making use of comparative advantage of the Southeast Asian region had first reached out to the Southeast Asian region to produce at a competitive rate and therefore the production network was initially limited to the Asian region and not in, did not involve China. But when China came into um, operations in the economic uh, front, the competitive advantage of locating in China was so encouraging for Japanese investors that you see it saw in the codes of Japanese companies moving into China and then creating a kind of a, uh, supply chain network where you, it was very difficult to understand what, when a product would come and move between these, this region between and keep adding value to itself to create a product which was competitively uh, advantageous in the international market. We in India missed out that first round of uh, Japanese um, production network system and this is the second round that is emerging and it is at this point that becomes critical for India to take advantage and get into the world, uh, into the glo global value chain which is something that Ando san uh, essentially uh, focuses on in his talk. Yeah. Uh, what happens is that why I bring in the global shipping routes is what Saugata said that this particular um, uh, logistics is going to become digital in nature and we've already seen how hugely upgradations are going to happen with respect to this particular industry and this is where I think India can uh, sort of uh, focus and get its logistics in place and become a good, uh, you know, geopolitically become a region of um, uh, importance. Prakash, next slide, please. Um, I will not get into this. This has a strategic component, but we would uh, require this, um, you know, when we look at what kind of investment that India could be probably attracting from Japan. Next slide, please. Um, 
given what has already been discussed, that we both the countries have come up with packages uh, to attract um, uh, to one Japan to move away uh, production from China and India trying to woo Japanese investment into India. Uh, Prakash, the next slide. In the bilateral levels, obviously, Modi has called for vocal to local and uh, the self-reliant program, in which you immediately saw two uh, particular states coming up uh, strongly. One was Gujarat and other was Uttar Pradesh, which made overtures to so causing its business ups and trying writing to various prefectural and Japanese governments to invite states and offering them anything from land to subsidies and stretching uh, out to attract these two. And it, with respect to policy making, I would like to make two case in points. Prakash, the next slide. One is the electronic industry, which has already tried to in, intensifize, uh, incentivize this uh, to ensure that we could engage the SME sectors to, uh, to move in uh, direction to attract Japanese MSMEs, to enable them to start um, not only um, component level, uh, low skilled um, areas of operations, but also trying to attract in high-end operations and trying to create an alternative move up to that which had had a strong influence from the China, uh, from China. The other area which has been um, sort of brought out by the Indian government is FDI uh, under automatic group being increased to 74% in difference industry. This particular sector has a strong strategic component added to it, which we call as the Indo-Pacific region and keeping it as a free and fair, open Pacific region. And probably this is one sector in which, since it's going to be a relatively new sector of operations between India and Japan, and it is since it has got a strong government-to-government -government relationship, it requires a government-to-government -government understanding Probably this is one sector where we would have certain strong growth. As conclusions, I can say that what we've already said that we have to have, if we want to create India as an alternative hub, it has to be strongly today directed by the nations as private investors are still shaky about coming to India. Uh, Indian central estate government, as you've seen, are now actually trying to attract and would be more accommodated to their regulations and probably relaxations of rules, which would therefore create uh, opportunities for uh, Japanese investors. What I think is becomes critical at this point is to identify and target the Japanese business houses from Indian business houses and try, try to create synergy at ground level given that the, at the um, official level we have things in place with respect to institutional actors as well as government-to-government -government relationship being in a very sustainable, strong mode of uh, friendship. I think it is ground-level business houses that needs to start acting on the policy framework that is already in place. Thank you so much for your attention. Thank you so much, uh, Shabani. As expected, really, this is, I mean, understanding, I think, for anybody of, you know, the whole gamut of the relationship from when it took off and to where we are now and what more needs to be done. A couple of things that you said of, you know, particular, I, I think, importance is the coincidence of economic interests and the strategic aspect of our relationship, particularly both of us being kind of leaders in this concept, in this construct of the Indo-Pacific Indo uh, construct. So I think that's really a very important point. The other thing is the importance of state governments, which you mentioned. Uh, I think state governments are aware of it. And, you know, since uh, the equivalent to states in Japan are prefectures and Japanese industry is very dispersed all over Japan, it is important for our state governments to go and look at the opportunities there. I had, as you had mentioned, I promoted partnership between states and prefectures because I found that that gave a certain momentum to uh, the relationship. Um, and I'm completely, uh, completely with you that I think the time is now where we really identify sectors, we identify uh, Japanese business houses and corresponding Indian companies, and we also improve the environment, make it easier for SMEs to come into India. So there's a lot of work that needs to be done on uh, our side, but I think equally on the, on the Japanese side also, that we will be looking to them to give a little more of a push to Japanese companies to come to India. So thanks so much, Shravani. Uh, now, I think uh, we will ask uh, Dr. Panesh Sarvan, um, 
that he could take some uh, questions from the speakers. I'm looking at the time. I think we have um, maybe uh, 20, 25 minutes, a few uh, questions, and then we can sum up. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you, ma'am, and uh, thank you uh, all speakers like uh, making a re relevant assessment on idea Japan investment. Uh, I got some couple of questions uh, through emails uh, from professors abroad. Uh, it, it is open to the panelists, like uh, they can choose. The first question is they've been arguing like uh, India-Japan relationship. Uh, we've been talking more about strategy uh, and like cooperating about naval cooperation. So is that they think that uh, they use the Indo-Pacific platform to enhance or like advance our economic cooperation. So I just want your reflection on that. And the second question, which often uh, rise, uh, like been like asked is that given like problem with India's um, uh, problem, like a perennial problem with infrastructure and other issues. So how Japan is finding India as a very attractive place and what makes Japan more, uh, the, uh, what makes uh, India more attractive to Japanese investment. So these are the questions which I got it through from the email. And uh, if, if uh, this is open to any panel, so I'll read like some questions which has been answered in this uh, chat session because <coughs> Professor uh, uh, Shabni Roy just finished her presentation. So I'll give like two minutes for the audience to like prep for the questions. Um, sorry, Prakash, who are you addressing? Would you like everybody to speak to these points? I mean, uh, it can be like, a, it's okay. Uh, it's open to any panelists. Like if okay, so we will start with uh, um, uh, Andusan. Andusan, maybe you could respond and then uh, to, um, uh, to Dr. Bhattacharya and then to Shavani. Sure. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Prakash. Uh, those are very good questions, actually. Uh, the first one on free uh, in, in the Pacific. This is very important. As Ambassador Wada mentioned, this is this strategic concept as well as economic. I think we need to have a, a free and open in the Pacific. When, when we say that, uh, you know, one thing is that we need to have a maritime security so that we can have a trade of goods and services through the Indian Ocean and Pacific Ocean. Uh, so that is something we need to maintain uh, with the, uh, between India and Japan. And also in terms of economy, uh, I mentioned connectivity in my previous remarks that connectivity is one of the keywords for, uh, uh, for, for binding us together, uh, connecting, connecting with the uh, roads or uh, railways, uh, ports, airports, and so forth. So, uh, I, mean, in, I mean, within India itself, we need more infrastructure, and Japan has been cooperating with this. But also in other countries like uh, uh, neighboring countries, India, where, or, uh, where we need more infrastructure so that we can have uh, a better uh, uh, connectivity. Uh, and uh, I need to uh, raise the, uh, north, uh, the, the development in Northeast. Northeast in India is very important uh, strategically, economically. So uh, Japan and India have been working uh, on uh, infrastructure for this. But as the uh, Shabani san mentioned that the uh, important point for uh, connectivity is uh, quality infrastructure. Uh, that is something we need. Uh, I mean, infrastructure should be open, uh, not closed. Uh, it should be free and, uh, not, I mean, not, I mean uh, not, free, not free for uh, money, but uh, open and also uh, economic viability. And we, we need to talk about the recipient of the economic uh, benefits. So uh, we need some sort of uh, quality infrastructure, which have we, we have been promoting with India. So I think, you know, uh, in the Pacific idea uh, uh, can be strengthened uh, uh, bilaterally and with other countries in, in the region uh, in terms of strategic uh, sense as well as in economic sense. And the second question about the uh, uh, India's attractiveness as an uh, independent uh, investment. Of course, India has a huge potential. I mean, from the Japanese eyes, India is a big country and lots of people, and lots of uh, uh, new developments coming, very booming country. And uh, that, that is uh, what we see India potential uh, in a younger population. If you look at Japanese population, we are aging, uh, our population is shrinking. But India, we have a hope, we see a hope in India. So uh, lots of Japanese companies are very interested in uh, investing in India, as, uh, as we know. Uh, 
Uh, but there are some challenges, as I mentioned, as other speakers mentioned, about the regulation, a state and, uh, a state and uh, central government, or a tax system, and so forth. But uh, there's, th these are the issues that we can overcome. And as I said at the beginning, this is a very moment, this is an opportunity uh, that has fallen upon us uh, I mean, after COVID-19, that the, uh, we can have more uh, uh, we can have more Japanese companies attracted to India. So uh, uh, that's what I want to talk about for the, those two questions. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Andersan. I think you brought in a few more ideas really into this issue of uh, maritime security, the issue of connectivity, which we talk also in the context of the uh, Indo-Pacific. Um, uh, could I ask, uh, please, Mr. Uh, uh, Bhattacharya, for your views, please, for your comments? Um, so I'm, I'm not going to address uh, the, uh, the potential for Japanese investments uh, directly, but uh, just a couple of points. I think India has built up a fair bit of uh, expertise in some manufacturing and industrial sectors. Uh, things like specialty chemicals, uh, engineering. I mean, we make some of the most advanced pumps in the world now. Uh, pharma, of course. So I, I think we need to play on these uh, uh, on the on the strengths that we that we have got, uh, and 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 there are some some uh, uh, encouraging signs. I mean, you know, the news yesterday that the railways is looking for uh, privatization of railway services, etc. So I, I think that's that's one point in this. In the electricity sector, I think it's definitely a problem. Uh, the power sector. Um, uh, we, uh, despite all the other schemes, all the other uh, previous initiatives to uh, improve the efficiency of the power sector, uh, not too much has happened. But there is some uh, uh, scope for, for uh, uh, some scope for encouragement. Uh, the focus on renewables now, I think, is a very very important one. I, I, I think uh, we are moving away from a coal-based system into cleaner forms of energy, etc. So that's one part. The second part, which is the key, the key weakness of the power segment, uh, which is the discounts, which is the collection side. And, and now there are uh, significant initiatives now to start uh, investments into things like smart metering, et cetera, smart meters, uh, which is likely to increase uh, collections uh, uh, and, and reduce the losses. Uh, the, uh, and, and that eventually, hopefully, uh, will enable state governments uh, to try to reduce the disparity between residential and commercial rates. India's industrial and commercial electricity tariffs are some of the highest in the world. Uh, that needs to come down. Uh, so I, I think some of these initiatives, I think, are good beginnings. But I mean, there are so many other vectors in which you can start improving uh, things. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, yes, I do think that, you know there there are this. I think this uh, the uh, private sector encouragement, private sector in the railways will be opportunities for Japan also. I mean, it has opened up, I think, a new avenue for. Uh, for cooperation and you know we're talking about renewals i recall when i was there and there was a uh, soft bank you mentioned soft bank also and mr son masayoshi son being so upbeat about renewals and solar power in india he was saying i'll put 20 billion into india you know so there is existing um, interest and i think we have to build on that uh, shabani could i just have your comments too please in 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 the context of what prakash has asked yeah yeah perfect um what i would like to point out is uh, little detrimental uh, side of the whole thing. While Ando-san uh, has correctly pointed out that Japanese looks towards India as a booming, you know, young aged population with lots of huge consumer base. Unfortunately, I think for India, the labor productivity rate has not been matching up to the young, you know, uh, uh, population segment that we have. And this is, I think, one place where distinctively, um, you know, training programs or some kind of educational system which can harness this uh, skill set that, you know, exists in a very raw form which needs to be channelized into the kind of uh, um, skill set that would be appreciated by the, uh, the growing sectors. And this is why I constantly come back to one thing that I always see is strong sectoral directions from our educational system also, which would essentially be enable the growth of the right skill set that is required by not only Japanese uh, FDI investors, but also I think across the world, global investors. And I think this is one place while there's a huge consumerism, rise of consumerism in India, 
we need to focus on getting the health and the education system in place such that it enables engaging this young population in a very productive fashion. I think this is something that I would like to spell out at this. And it's a very nice um, platform to spell this out because we, it, I'm hoping that it will go across to policy making uh, directions. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Shabnish. Thank you very much. Prakash, can we take some yes. more questions? Uh, yes, ma'am. Like, uh, there's one uh, question from uh, Sanjana Bias. Uh, this is actually quite relevant uh, what uh, Professor Shabani, uh, ma'am, she spoke like uh, about future of Japanese investment in post COVID world. Like how the Parma has been gaining a lot of, uh, attracts a lot of investment. So uh, what do you think about this post COVID environment? Do you think that Parma will continue to attract a lot of investment uh, uh, in compared with other sectors? Shabani, I think is addressed. We have to. Uh, yeah. yeah, sorry, I thought it was addressed to the panel. Um, see, one thing is there that the Rambak Sidaichi's, uh, you know, booking has not been very great. And that is one thing that has actually created a huge image barrier for Indian pharma, uh, you know, sector. However, uh, ESAI has done a uh, very good uh, outing out here. They have a huge uh, plant in Vishakapatnam. And what is very interesting is during this COVID time, Maruti itself has um, used uh, its um, base, the assembling units to come up with uh, ventilators, though it's of a very small amount of 100 ventilators or so. But there is, uh, you know, there was, is a possibility that it, if we work uh, in the right direction with respect to, uh, you know, addressing the issues that Daichi Rambaxi faced, uh, in a more productive, you know, in, encouraging the Japanese investors to understand that one such pitfalls is not going to be the reason that others cannot be successful. I think we should be able to encourage a much more, you know, bigger participation in um, um, investing in India. But more importantly, I think in the trade front with the SEPA being renegotiated, I think we should get a the huge entry in, as far as generic uh, drug goes in with respect to uh, Japan's uh, import into like India's export to Japan would probably increase the generic drug sector. That is the hope that we have with the CEPA negotiation that is on the table right now. Yeah, thanks. Uh, there is one question from Anonymous to the panel. Uh, so uh, it asks about like RCEP like. So uh, what is the status of RCEP then will it like the ongoing puzzle between like India and China? So uh, how Japan said that it will stand with India, like if it, India is signing, so it will go forward. So whether it will have any impact on the investment, like, so it's a, to the panel, I think, like, on the sun, I can. On the sun, maybe. <laughs> thank you, thank you for, <laughs> thank you for uh, addressing that question to me. As I said in my uh, actual opening remarks that uh, uh, it is important that India and Japan on their global value uh, chain and uh, in this context, I said that uh, it is important that uh, uh, India uh, uh, will, will be part of RCEP. And actually, there is a ministerial meeting recently held. And uh, I mean, at, and in that joint statement, they said that India has been an uh, important participant in our RCEP negotiations, and uh, India's participation in RCEP would contribute. To the advancement and prosperity of the region, and we therefore wish to emphasize that the uh, outset remains open for India. So that is the message we have and send, uh, we are sending to India. So uh, it's up to India to decide. Um, I look forward to hearing from uh, uh, views from Indian side. Yes. <laughs> Who else would like to answer this very interesting question, um, Mr. Bhattacharya? Any views? I think we have to I'm unmute. I'm, I'm, I'm not a uh, uh, trade and investment uh, uh, specialist, but all I, I seem to, and, and ma'am, I mean, uh, with, with people like you uh, in, as, as part of the uh, interlocutors team, uh, I, all I understand is, I think the government's view seems to be uh, that we should be looking at more FTA plus type uh, deals with a few countries, uh, test the waters there, uh, wet our feet, and then try to get into a, a broader 
uh, trade uh, congregation like uh, RSEC is the only thing that I and and frankly how this uh, merges with the Atmanirbhar Bharat uh, is something which needs to be uh, looked at much more closely. Thank you. Yes, that's the sense one has also. I mean, as one looks at it, and we are very, I think, grateful in a way to Japan because you know they kept the doors open to us. They tried to sort of, you know, uh, cajole us to join and taken care on, uh, taken on board our concerns. Uh, Shavani, do you have something to say on the um, answer? I think it is as uh, I think the major question I think that has uh, been questioned at the uh, most of the ASEAN countries as well as Japan is. How are we looking at this Atmanirbhar scheme of our policy making of whether we are really going to be looking at uh, how we are going to integrate it with the foreign uh, direct investment? Because it seems to be a very, you know, move back to that self-sufficient, self-reliant economic model that was once practiced in our country. But as far as uh, what I see of the academic writing emerging with RCEP is there is a very strong um, position from most of the uh, ASEAN uh, re as well as uh, the East Asian region that India should become a strong participant of it. India's fears with respect to, uh, you know, whether we would lose out on certain industries, etc. and therefore taking the mode of FTA plus has always, why India is saying that it will have to wait out. And I think that move when we were required to uh, join the RCEP at that point of time, I think our uh, country was facing a lot of political as well as economic upheavals. And I think the government did not want to add one more aspect to its problem sets of problems at that point of time. And probably that's why it shied away. But I think the pandemic in a way is an opportunity to open up and link up things and say, oh, we need to do this because we will not be able to attract Japanese investments or cannot join the global value chain until unless we join the RCEP. It could be an easier move for the government to join, considering you have a lot of opposition to it in our country, right? Yes, Prakash, any, any more questions? Yes, ma'am. There is one question from uh, Dr. Anand. Uh, he, like, uh, we've been talking about the Asia Africa Growth Corridor. So it's been mentioned once in the, uh, I think, in the joint statement after that. Uh, there's there's no much of news happen on that front. So people are thinking that will bring a lot of investment to India, where like India will be a major manufacturing hub in this region. So uh, what would be uh, uh, future of uh, Asia Africa growth corridor? Uh, so like uh, I think like answer like Professor Shami like and I think Ma'am can answer. <laughs> Well, just for one thing, just to factually correct, I don't think the Asia-Africa Growth Corridor per se was ever mentioned anywhere in any outcome document. But having said that, I think the idea for both countries to work together, in, in for Japan and India to work together in third countries, still continues to be a very important part of our, our partnership. So, you know, we have projects now in Bangladesh, in Sri Lanka, in Myanmar, and we're certainly looking at Africa too. But I think I will um, ask uh, both um, Andersan and Shabani to give their views on this. Andersan? Yes, uh, thank you, Ambassador Wano. I think you said what I wanted to say already. So uh, <laughs> uh, not, 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 much to, not much to add, but uh, you know, uh, I mean, she's is quite right in saying that we have lots of projects. Uh, Bangladesh, Sri Lanka, and uh, Kenya as well in Africa. Kenya, yes. So uh, yeah, yeah. So, uh, uh, we are expanding these projects uh, in Asia and Africa, and uh, I think we are now working on free and open the Pacific concept. So uh, 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 I think in, in this context, we are working together uh, in a lot of projects in Asia and Africa. So that's, that's what I have to say. Thanks. Thanks. Shabani, anything you'd like to add? No, other than the fact that I think comparative advantage uh, that one can see between uh, Japan, India and working in Africa, I think the comparative advantage uh, options are very high. And as Kenya uh, invest, investment shows to us, but the problem out there is essentially there's a lot of Chinese investments also in most of the African countries. And I think how our investment uh, can sort of be... Uh, provider of something more than what the Chinese investment is 
is going to be the way that we would have to move forward in Africa, I think. And therefore, I, I really appreciate the fact of the ODA um, uh, statement these days, which is called as quality infrastructure and quality um, technology. I think these two are going to be our uh, basic key sellers with respect to investment in Africa. But because Africa is an area where I think most uh, in countries would now be pushing them, especially in the post-pandemic situation, because that is one area, uh, one uh, region in the world which can have multiple options of various sectors growing at the same time, as well as using the latest technology for growth. So I think it will become a hub for uh, most uh, countries to test out investments out there in the post-pandemic situation. Thank you. Yeah, I think the idea always was that, you know, uh, combined India and Japan uh, could give an alternate uh, model in, Af in Africa where yet the Chinese are there, uh, they do dominate, but you know, there's also been a pushback as far as they're concerned. So I think there are a lot of opportunities and we've said that our industry should lead this, but a little more of, I think, um, focus on both governments to give direction to our industries would help in this area. That's the, that's the feeling that one, is, one gets. Prakash, any more questions? We have uh, a think... map. We're almost at the end of it. One more question, I think. I think uh, we're almost there. Like, I think uh, 28, not 28. I think, like, it, it's nice to wind up. Like, uh, I'll request you to give the, your views okay. and concluding remarks. That is okay. So, thank you very much. I mean, just leaves to me to thank all the panelists. I mean, for me, it's been extremely, extremely uh, interesting. And I'm sure uh, everybody else who's been part of this webinar has also gone, um, you know, will take away from this uh, completely sort of. Uh, in, in a way, a realistic perspective of, of Japan-India relation, but also the huge potential. It's the P word we use all the time about India-Japan. And I keep wonder, wondering when from P we'll move to R, that's to realization. And also about the uh, general investment uh, climate in India. I think we should look beyond this positively. We have a lot of intrinsic strengths. So um, again, with those few words, I'll thank all the panelists. And over to you, Prakash. Thank you for managing this very well. Thank you, ma'am, and uh, thank you all the speakers and panelists as well. And uh, it's a very, it's a uh, it's great pleasure that uh, to having you all in this webinar. And I know like uh, we canceled this before because of the technical reason. And I really thought it will not be able to happen because of the, I know like, uh, because of the, your busy schedule. And a special thanks to uh, Madam Chadipa Vadwa for uh, uh, conducting this seminar. And, uh, and a special thanks to uh, Ando San as well. Uh, I know that he's quite busy, like he's responded, I've been troubling for past one and a week, like about like fixing the time and schedule. And uh, this uh, webinar would have not happen without the help of uh, um, Professor Shabani Rai Chaudhary. I think she has pulled up all these panelists and she helped me in coordinate with all these people. And uh, thank you very much, ma'am. And uh, as a final one, like, uh, thank you, sir, Sagata uh, Patacharya, sir. Like, uh, and for your patience and you replied to all my queries at the same time giving the time uh, despite uh, you've been like moving around uh, uh, in this pandemic situation so uh, this video is uh, available in the youtube and i will also share this video link with you as well so, so thank you very much for uh, having you all and uh, i hope uh, when this pandemic situation is over i will like to invite you to our campus at nias and like to have a more uh, discussion on india japan uh, investment opportunity Thank you very much and uh, 